Thank you, uh, Michael. What I'd like to do now is to get the two speakers to come up here, uh, and we can open it up to a few questions. And also the three panelists in this session, who uh, I'd like to give them four minutes each after, uh, after we've taken a few questions. They are uh, David Sathaway, if you could come up here as well, um, Lisa Emberson, and uh, Sir Chris uh, Llewellyn-Smith, who we've moved from the second session into this one. So if we could, uh, first of all, just, just allow you to get some of your thoughts out. Are there any questions? If you could give your name, please, your name. Um, and keep the question ideally short, or if it's a comment, keep it short. One, two. Yeah, uh, my name is Terry Barker I'm from Cambridge University and the Cambridge Centre for Climate Change Mitigation Research. I've been involved in this work as an he knows for about 15 years. Um, first of all, a big thank you for, to the presenters uh, uh, the, uh, and, and to the people, all the people contributing the report. This is a, a real and substantial contribution to the literature and it comes just at the right time between the assessment reports. I'm sure it was all designed. Naki, Naki knows what he's doing. <laughs> uh, my two questions. One is, um, one is uh, much easier to answer than the other. The first one is, uh, you showed us this graph of total uh, energy investment. Uh, what it would be nice to know would be the division between the, uh, the, the low greenhouse gas investments the nuclear investments and the fossil investments because that really shows uh, the domination of the fossil investments in all of this uh, and, and it's really so dramatic and it, I, thought, I thought you could bring that out much more and I don't think it's much to do with subsidies by the way I think that's a bit of a red heading but um, to my main point I was, I was really rather puzzled by the lack of discussion of the portfolio of instruments necessary the carbon prices uh, uh, that, are, that, are, that I see as necessary to bring about uh, the energy efficiency and, uh, and, the, and the rest. Um, in the work, I've, I've been looking intensively at this issue of decarbonisation with the same target as you've, you've chosen. Uh, but I use the policies that the IEA have in their World Energy Outlook, which are very oriented to what governments actually do as to what it would be nice to do. You see the huge difference between that. Um, and what we find is that regulation, surprisingly, is rather minor a, a, as, a, as an instrument. Um, and that's very interesting, why it should be. What, what does the heavy lifting in mitigation is carbon pricing in various forms. Now, the reason for why this should be is, first of all, the rebound effect. I won't go into that, it's a bit complicated, but uh, the rebound effect undermines energy efficiency by essentially, uh, this is very economic, economics point. Secondly, when you actually look at regulation, it's rather unfortunate that the ideal re regulation turns in, it gets weakened by politicians, okay, sorry, um, weakened by politicians who erode the planning regulations through for political reasons. And finally, my final point is, is what is actually necessary is the carbon price to induce technological change through the, in the investments that you're talking about. And without the carbon price, you don't get it. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we could keep our questions fairly short. <laughs> could, I, could I also, I, I'm going to take a number of questions, just to be more uh, efficient. Please. Michael Jefferson, I'll keep my uh, question to renewable energy. Um, it's chapter 11, 139 pages of yeah. that chapter. Um, and the, of course the conclusion uh, and, and the premise is that renewable energy forms are widely available and abundant. Um, that raised a few questions in my mind. Um, really the only one that is assuredly abundant is uh, solar energy, and in particular in the form of concentrating solar power. And for those who don't have a, a higher uh, solar insulation area around about them, uh, ultra-high voltage direct current transmission. Now we see, of course, Bosch and Siemens are the latest to back off the Desert Turk concept, and of course all, all sorts of queries about socio-political stability in North Africa. But I'm unhappy with the way in which the Global Energy Assessment doesn't really confront uh, the uh, various power densities, the Vaclav Smil uh, approach to, to the subject, um, nor really uh, am I terribly happy about some of the other forms of renewable energy which are discussed. Uh, for instance, on uh, biotechnology, uh, biofuel technology, 
where the latest IAS research is much less uh, optimistic about uh, second generation uh, biofuel technology, particularly in the European context. Um, also, uh, very concerned about the very high capacity factors uh, given in uh, three of the tables uh, in the policy maker summary, technical summary, and in chapter 11 on uh, w wind energy. Um, I don't know where those figures came from, but they are far, far higher than those for uh, onshore UK, offshore UK, Denmark, Germany, etc. So, not perhaps a, uh, um, a, a very clear question, but I think overall there's over optimism well, about I'm sure energy. the speakers would do their best to answer. Let me, let me take those two. Neki first, and then I'll, uh, Michael to add a, a comment, should you wish. Yeah, uh, for, first a comment to, to Terry's questions. Um, in, 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 the, in particular in chapter 11, but also in the, in the policy chapters, th there is a breakdown of exactly what you're looking for, how much goes to nuclear, how much goes to fossils, and, and maybe I have, in the, in the haste of staying within 15 minutes, I have stylized many things, and my apologies to Michael as well, because the investment numbers I've given are kind of orientational for the future. With 40 pathways, the, the variation is very large. It's between doubling total investments, which means tripling all the renewables. So yeah. we are in the same ballpark. I've shown a little bit more humble scenario where everything goes well. So that, that's the quick response to that. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, I didn't focus much of the instruments, but the book does. I mean, one quarter of the volume is about policies, um, ranging for specific ones for technology, uh, innovation, specific ones for access. We put quite lots of effort into that, and so on and so forth. But my conclusion would be the contribution of GEA, I mean, policies have been discussed everywhere. The contribution of GEA is about the portfolios, really. And you know, how, how do you make the transformation? Um, you, you mentioned those a rebound effect. Let me just offer you an po alternative interpretation for the three billion who do not have the access. Rebound is a great thing. Yeah. That means that <laughs> with, with efficiency, they can achieve with very little energy the services that they need. But I do realize that in, you know, in areas like, like the UK or Europe and US, clearly rebound is an issue that needs to be dealt with the policy portfolios. Now, to, to Michael, yeah, the, the renewable chapter turned out to be the biggest. It's almost a book on its own. So it has lots of rich material. Um, I, I understand, I mean, your pessimism that, you know, desert tech is not working and so on. But the desert tech is not necessarily the, the requirement, I think, and I think uh, Michael has captured that well. I mean, uh, Gaia says we need all of those solutions. He, he, on, renewables is not no one option. It's, it's a system, and it has to be the part of the rest of the energy system. But having said that, um, uh, the authors did sp spend quite lots of time on some of the issues. The bioenergy is a chapter on its own. Uh, because it needs really careful attention. Uh, like with all of the other energy sources, colleagues looked at what is the maximum out of memory on the order of about 240 exajoules worldwide compared to the fi uh, 500 of the current primary energy needs. So half of it could be done in principle, but with lots of problems. That's pr most likely not sustainable to go so far. The sustainable number identified in GEA is more in the region of 80, 80 exajoules. So an increase above the current level of about 50. Uh, but um, I think one has to worry about competition with food, and that is, was a very important part of Gaia. And of course, you know, Pavel can tell us the water story. Water is a very important part of that as well. Um, so, I, you know, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, wind, offshore wind, and so on. These are all of the issues. But I think if you look also in the chapter 11 with the pathways, um, how the mix comes together, I think you will get some more information on, your, on, on the question and challenge you have raised. Thank you, uh, thank you. Michael, any comments? Yeah, look, there's a few things I would pick up on, if I may. Um, the, um, the split, it's a very interesting one, the split between renewable energy and fossil. Um, if you look at generating capacity in the electrical system alone, then renewable energy is already at about 40% with fossil at about uh, at 50 um, nuclear, because not, many, not much being built right now outside a few countries, is, is relatively small. Um, that masks the reality, though, 
Uh, and by the way, in Europe, of course, we're investing far more in renewables than we are in fossil or anything, if you look at the, particularly because of Germany's rooftop solar and, and Italy and so on. Um, so that it, it's probably over 70% renewable uh, spend on the generating side globally, as I say, somewhere around 40. Um, but that masks the reality because the fossil fuel guys are also investing in mines and railways and ports and ships and then more ports and more railways and so on. And and, and that, of course, overwhelms uh, the investment flows. On policy, I'm afraid I disagree with you. I think that the, to, it, it's, it's, it would be wonderful if a single carbon price or a carbon price would be the only um, you know, sufficient. Uh, I think it's got enormous flaws in terms of the, um, the cross subsidy or the, the, uh, the value flows um, that would result if we tried to use the single tool of a carbon price. Um, that may be economically might make wonderful sense, but politically the idea of these absolutely tremendous, if we had the sim, same carbon price to encourage energy efficiency, wind energy, switching from coal to gas, uh, carbon capture and storage, solar power, all of these things happen at different price points. Uh, and so therefore a single carbon price would, would create enormous windfalls for some, and particularly by the way people with forests would love it. Um, and so for that reason, I don't think it would work, but it also ignores the co-benefits of each of those technologies. And so, frankly, you can get things done with lower carbon prices if they do other nice things like provide jobs or are cool. Um, and so we've got to take what we will see and what we are seeing is multiple carbon prices and enormous policy complexity. Because the final point is, to the point about renewable energy, um, it's a systems approach that's needed. The, you, can't, you can take wind and you can do a levelised cost. And by the way, it's progressing you know, very fast. I, I, I don't know what uh, capacity factors you see for the UK, but if you look at new onshore wind in the UK, they have very, very healthy capacity factors and quite low cost. <laughs> Mr. Solar. Mr. So, so, so you, but, but, but the issue is really that you, what you need is system evolution, including a smart grid, including power storage, including electric vehicles, including the high voltage DC interconnects, and so on. And about, finally, just on Desertec, what is Desertec? What do you define Desertec as? There will be solar in North Africa. There will be interconnects spreading out across Europe and into North Africa and so on. That will happen. The single defining characteristic of Desertec was German and European utilities funding solar in North Africa and expensive connections through the power takeoff agreements. That, frankly, was always a pipe dream. I said it at the time, by the way, so I'm very confident uh, you know, up here. That was always a stretch. And now, of course, we see solar, too much solar in Germany. For they can't cope with their own solar, and therefore Desertec as Desertec will not happen. But we see big solar happening in North Africa with the Wazazat project, and we'll see many, many more. So I don't think it's time to, you know, to declare defeat on, on solar in, in Africa. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, there will be the opportunity to come back if you want to uh, a little bit later. I'd like now to bring in the panelists. Uh, four minutes each. David, if we can move down the line. Um, oh, thanks. I was a bit surprised to be invited here. I work in squatter settlements, in slums, in cities in Africa, Asia, Latin America. About one in seven of the world lives in them. And I, you know, do water and sanitation and drainage and healthcare and schools and fights for tenure and voice and the ability to um, access your entitlements and, of course, energy. But big energy studies aren't much interested in urban. They think that all the problems are in rural areas. And big energy isn't much interested in, in low-income groups' needs and priorities. But the global energy assessment was. And it's, I think, the first time that you've got this combination of the global picture um, addressing the key issues in Europe and North America and really seriously addressing the issue of energy access in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. I'll talk about urban because that's where I work. It doesn't mean that there aren't very serious problems in rural areas. But the 700 million urban dwellers, 700 million, who lack access to clean fuels. About the same number lack access to electricity. And this includes large numbers in major cities. 
Access to electricity, of course, is a huge advantage to low-income households, especially to women who usually um, have household-based enterprises. And, of course, electricity is fantastic for, for, for basic electrical equipment, for lighting, um, fridges, for instance, especially when they prepare food. Now, of course, there's a worry that if, if we get decent energy access to 700 billion urban dwellers, is it going to increase greenhouse gas emissions? But the figures in the global energy assessment suggest not. You know, a concentration on much more efficient systems, um, a decline in deforestation from fuelwood use, and the avoidance of, um, of minor contributions to global warming from black soot actually make it possible to transform energy access without increasing greenhouse gas emissions significantly. But the barrier, and I'll end, I'll, I'll end with the big barrier, the big barrier is that most of these billion people in informal settlements, governments ignore them. They've had to settle land illegally. They're often in settlements with no legal address. Very often you can't get access to electricity or to um, commercial fuels without a legal address. So the issue here is not only that it is possible and feasible to reach them with electricity and clean fuels, but it's will local authorities, will local governments actually do so and recognize that you know, the half of the population in Nairobi in informal settlements, the 70% of the population in Mumbai in informal settlements, have the right to be included in all matters, including electricity and clean fuels. Thank you, uh, David. I, we'll have the three speakers and then we'll, we'll go back out to Lisa. Okay. Um, so I was involved in Gaia um, and helped to write the energy and environment um, chapter. Um, what I'd like to do is, is go through um, a list of other benefits that I don't think have necessarily been considered um, so far yet, uh, which will come around if we do achieve the Gaia target of um, ensuring universal access to clean energy for 95% of the population by 2030, which is, is, is quite a challenging target. But if we do achieve it, um, I think we can see multiple both environmental and also human health benefits in achieving that target. Um, current energy systems contribute about 80% of um, carbon dioxide and 30% of methane man-made emissions. They also contribute quite a large fraction of black carbon, and all of these are causing climate change. So if we have a move to cleaner energy, for example, based on less reliance on traditional, often unsustainable biomass, then we'll see potentially quite large reductions in these um, greenhouse gas emissions. One of the targets that we've heard of today um, within Gaia was trying to limit global mean temperature change um, to the two degrees C goal. And if that is achieved, then um, we can see substantial benefits um, in terms of um, benefits for, for not having environmental degradation such as sea level rise, changes in cryosphere, changes in biodiversity, and um, a far reduced frequency of some of the extreme events. And in the UK, we've, I think, all been a little bit aware of the costs, for example, that are associated with some of those extreme events such as um, flooding, which has happened just recently. Um, in terms of clean access to energy, um, we also need to think about not just the long-lived greenhouse gases, but also some of the short-lived climate forces, such as black carbon and ozone. Um, if we start to pull those down, then we can see very immediate benefits in terms of climate change, which gives us a far greater likelihood of actually achieving that 2 degrees C target. If we start reducing um, black carbon as well, um, then that will start to see improvements in terms of particulate matter, and that will actually save lives. Um, it's estimated at the moment that about 2.7 and 2.2 million um, lives are currently ended prematurely due to both um, indoor and outdoor air pollution. So if we start bringing down those particulate matter concentrations, then we can start saving many of those lives, particularly in Africa and in Asia. Along with some of the emissions... Um, that come from our, using our energy system. We have emissions of nitrogen oxides. Um, if we have cleaner energy and access is increased to the, a greater population to that cleaner energy, then we'll start to reduce our nitrogen oxide um, emissions through um, combustion efficiencies. 
That will mean that we'll have less reactive nitrogen being put into the environment. That will improve the situation for eutrophication, for acidification, all with benefits to biodiversity. We'll also see reductions in ozone pollution, and people have mentioned previously um, about the benefits to food security. If we have less ozone pollution, then we'll have improved crop yields. And we can also see benefits to ecosystem productivity by reducing these um, air pollutants as well, which can actually improve carbon sequestration and actually provide a positive um, feed forward in terms of lowering atmospheric CO2 and again helping us reach that um, two degrees C target. Finally as well, we'll also see um, less pressure on local and land water resources if less people are having to rely on those traditional um, biomass sources of energy. So I think raising awareness of um, many of these multiple benefits that we can see by actually uh, bringing about universal access to clean energy will perhaps make people more aware of the substantial costs um, that can be saved by making the um, transition towards a much cleaner energy system. Thank you, Lisa. Chris? Yeah, I'd first like to congratulate Hayasa on this monumental uh, document. It's enormously valuable. It's a gold mine of information. And I'm certainly going to keep it on my desk where I can get hold of it to look things up, even if I don't agree with everything in it. It's a first port of call, very, very clear. And I'm very impressed that it looks at access, it looks at air pollution, it looks at the whole thing as a systems problem, which, as many people have said, is absolutely vital. The report tells us what, what should happen, what we'd like to happen, I agree with that, and it convinced me that it could happen. My concern is that we're going in the opposite direction, and I want to stress the gap at the risk of finding negative between the scenarios and what's actually happening. The report presents things from a glass half full perspective, and that's good. For example, it reminds us that in the years 2008 to 10, half of new electricity generating capacity was renewable. But there's a half glass half empty point of that. First of all, capacity is not output, and secondly, it started from a very low base. If you look at the BP figures, if we leave out hydro, renewables to electricity generation contributed 1.5% in the year 2000, and it did increase to 2010 to 3.7%. It's still very small. But in that period, the contribution of fossil fuels to electricity generation went up more from a 63% to 67%. It was nuclear that went down as a percentage. Let's look at the gap, and I want to look at what various scenarios say for 2030 compared to 2010, which is not the base year you took, but we have data for uh, 2010. So the three scenarios that are emphasized in the executive summary have energy use in 2030 relative to 2010 going up between 7 and 30%. And fossil fuel use going down 12 to 14 percent, something like that. Now, many of you will know that every year BP brings out a scenario of what they think will happen. This is not business as usual. It's a serious look at what they think will happen. That has energy use going up more, 39 percent. But the real point is it has fossil fuels in that period going up 31 percent plus 31 percent as opposed to minus 13 percent. There's a 40 percent gap between what we would like to happen and you've shown could happen and what it looks as if will happen. Now the government, and it's not just governments, I agree that it's a fractal problem, but they need to adapt and implement policies that will steer us from what BP thinks will happen to what we would like to happen. Now, many governments have announced commitments to move us in that direction. Most of them don't have any idea how to do it. But the IEA, as many of you also know, every year produces a new policy scenario in which they say, we'll do it for the governments. <laughs> we'll write down something which will meet their commitments. What does that predict? It predicts energy uh, up by less than in BP, uh, 35% as opposed to 39%, but, and fossil fuels less, 26% as opposed to 31%. But 20, plus 26% is a hell of a long way from minus 13%. So even, you know, even if we implement all the policies, it's miles away from where we ought to be. So there's a huge effort to you know, take a, convince everybody, and that's the hard part, and I'm coming in a moment to move away to more ambitious targets and, well, first of all, try and get to where we're supposed to be going in the first place. 
So steering the world is going to be a good big job. And I have a worry that, in fact, we're veering in the opposite direction. I was at a, a, a dinner of energy experts in July where John Brown, ex-BP, made a pre-dinner speech and he said, I'm going to make four provocative predictions for 2020 to stir up the discussion. Number one, U.S. will be energy independent by 2020. Number two, the whole world will be fracking. Number three, gas will be so cheap that by 2020 the world will have abandoned renewables and nuclear. And number four, there will be big geopolitical and economic consequences. Now, this is a sort of caricature, and I don't think even John thought that thinks that's going to happen, but it may be closer to what's going to happen than the scenarios, unfortunately. Now, I spent Monday in a meeting with some of the top world's oil and gas companies and analysts from the big bank, thinking about the consequences of the shale oil and gas revolution in the U.S. A huge uncertainty is technically how much fast can we get it out, how much there is, is there. And politically, will the U.S. allow exports of gas, etc.? But the possible scenario that emerges seems to look like this. The U.S. has continued to have very cheap gas for a long time. Not as cheap as today. That's not sustainable. But very cheap. Huge competitive advantage to their industry, by the way. Now, there is a good consequence of this. There will be a big decarbonization of the U.S. First of all, coal to gas. It's a big step. Secondly, probably a lot of trucks, lorries powered by, by gas. Third, if electricity is cheap enough, a lot of electrification of cars. That sounds great, but the problem is the U.S. are not leaving the coal in the ground. They're exporting it. They're digging up just as much, and they're exporting it. And outside the U.S., coal is very much cheaper than gas. What's the consequence? It's disastrous. Germany has announced the government they'd like to add 10 gigawatts of generating capacity in this decade to replace nuclear. I think they hoped it would be gas. What's happened? Just an uh, open 2.2 gigawatts of coal power. Lignite, by the way, the most dangerous possible thing for, for air pollution. And if you look at the world, there are on the table proposals to add 1.4 terawatts of electricity generating capacity. That's about half present capacity. So what should we do about this? And I agree, and I could talk for hours, so I'm just going to say two more things very quickly. But uh, first of all, get rid of the subsidies. It's ludicrous that the world is subsidizing the use of fossil fuels. $530 billion was the latest IEA figure. That's a consumption. There's another $100 million for production. And uh, although I agree with you about the you know, it's a blunt instrument, the carbon tax. We've got to put up the price of coal, first of all, and somehow get the world off coal. Now, I don't want this to sound negative about the report, although I've been a bit gloomy. I think the report's really done a great job of showing us what is possible. The big challenge now is to make it happen, and that is really hard. Thank you. I'd like to come back to particularly how we respond to uh, your reasonable view of where the world perceives it's going. And the IEA report that came out a week ago, to some extent, embodies some of uh, those views. So I'd like to come back to that at the end. What I'd like to do at the moment is to really go out to you and take any questions or views. And uh, do I see, uh, if you would please, uh, uh, one at the back, and then one, two, three. Uh, David Elms from Warwick Business School. Pick up this issue of distributed energy. I thought the chart showing Europe was interesting, um, but I suppose we spend our time looking at the challenges that companies have trying to make these policies work. Um, and the power industry has worked with big, long central power solutions for a very long time. Um, and trying to draw in the sort of developing countries or the urban areas without good access to energy. So does the report offer any insight or the panelists have any insight about how we can actually make uh, distributed energy work, both in developed and developing countries? Thank you. I'll, I'm going to take uh, three questions and then come back to the panel. Thanks very much. Christy Hamilton, Chatham House. Um, uh, we heard in the energy bill, so to make this a UK question, but as an example, that uh, energy intensive industries would be exempt from 
the uh, provisions to pay the CFD levies. So I'd just like to ask the panel, how do you think, given that these are political issues, uh, we should deal with the competitiveness issue because that comes up systematically in relation to many of the difficult political decisions that need made. Thank you. Third over there and fourth over there and then I go back to the panel. Martin, Martin Hay from uh, Scenarios team. I look after the energy modelling in the Scenarios team so this is quite close to what I do but we have a rather different approach which is to try and look at the sort of causal drivers today and where we're likely to end up. And I notice, just looking at a few of your graphs in, in the summary, you've got quite a lot of trend breaks from today. So that normally makes me a bit worried when if we see graphs that suggest that. It suggests that things have suddenly shifted to a different state. And what I, I realise that what you're trying to do is calculate back from a desirable end point, which requires some trend breaks from today. But what I wondered for this was where we have to sort of believe the most stretching things in your assumptions about what has to, you know, maybe some trend breaks are possible. But, uh, you know, just looking at this, I think coal peaks today. That's looking pretty unlikely at a world level. Um, it's looking as though solar is taking off from today. I mean, it is growing fast, but that's a pretty hairy growth rate from today. Because what those trend breaks mean is that the deployment rate is changing by an order of magnitude or something like that. And if, or if that's not changing, you know, if that's not changing by an order of magnitude, it means the guys that are supplying those people are having to suddenly go from delivering nothing to delivering a lot, if you like, the second derivative on the curve, if you like. And so the question, maybe this is getting a little bit detailed, but the question is really about what do you think are the most stretching things for us to have to believe, given you, you know, th th this is a plausible outlook. Thank you. Excellent question. Uh, Nick, maybe for me through G. Um, simple. This is for Michael, but the whole panel as well. Firstly, how much of the one trillion would have happened without an international process to manage climate change? <laughs> Two, how without a strong international agreement will the fractal change to meet the VAP, which has just been adequately described by everybody else? Well, some very good questions. I, th I think I'd like to start off with Naki, particularly the issue of <coughs> trend breaks from today, which is partly actually picks up some of the point that Chris was making about Thanks. his view. Would you comment? Yes. Uh, so we start with, uh, with the middle question, number three on my list. Yeah, I, I think these are very pertinent points, and, um, I, and, and I understand uh, you know, the dilemmas that you have raised. Um, in the global energy assessment, I think we have a very good chapter on technological change and technology <coughs> evolution. So one way of responding to you would be to say we are on the forefront of what would be feasible given the historical experience. I think the, 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 I think the more comforting news would be that, in your language, the trend breakers are not without examples that it can be done. Uh, I think what is challenging is that it, that would many of them would be occurring uh, concurrently, and I would share your concern and I always have them about two degree scenarios that you know the world is turned upside around within a few decades that you know we have analogs. Coal was replaced by coal within about six, seven decades, global in many countries faster. But uh, this is difficult, I think, to, to really internalize um, for one single, one single um, normative goal. I think what's different about GEA is that there are a, a multiple of normative goals. So the whole thing is about the opportunities. And I think we have stayed, or colleagues, Authors have stayed and we use models, formal models, two integrated assessment models to test the assumptions, um, have stayed within the envelope of, of um, you know, the, the, the type of diffusion rates that one can imagine. Uh, but certainly it is challenging. And I think as Chris said, you know, it's not, it's not what will happen under business as usual. I frankly think also business as usual is as infeasible as some of people might think that the transformational change is, is, um, is infeasible. So it's in the eye of the beholder, but I do have to submit that achieving many of these transformational pathways would require things to work, and I've mentioned that in my contribution, uh, one of our conclusions is that you cannot lose 
too many options on the way, so many things have to work. I mean, this is the, I think, the singularity, if you wish, that one should look for. Uh, if I may, can I just make a brief yeah. comment on, on the other one, on the exempting the, <laughs> exempting the, like in the you will pick it up? Okay, then I can leave it. Well, should I do it? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Okay, yeah. well, this question was asked in the context of UK policy, but it's a general one. Uh, I mean, the, the argument always against introducing in one region or one country some sort of carbon tax is it puts industry at a disadvantage uh, com compared to competitors and industry may move offshore to the Ukraine or, or, or wherever if you're in the UK. Now, the, the way around that is, is sort of well known, but let me just say something about it, which is to introduce what are called border carbon adjustments, where you charge for the carbon content of things that when they come in. Now, the arguments, uh, uh, and by the way, let me say the exemptions, it's not just the UK, the Australia also is putting exemptions, which yeah. undermines the whole point yeah. of the thing in many ways. Now, the arguments against border carbon adjustments are usually that this goes against the World Trade Organization. That's not obvious. And from a moral point of view, one shouldn't say that it's an unfair uh, duty to put on a carbon uh, tax of, on import. You should say that it's, a, it's an immoral subsidy not to have one. The people without one are destroying the, the planet. So that's the way to sell this. But the important thing to think about border carbon adjustments is if they were introduced, there are good reasons to think, and there's the game theory of this has been um, developed in quite some detail in a nice paper by Dieter Helm and Cameron Hepburn and somebody else's name I forget, that if, if you even threaten to do it in one area, it will encourage others to do it. So if you're in a country that doesn't charge for carbon and you're suddenly told, everything I send to Europe is going to have a tax on it, you will say, why the hell I let the Europeans take the tax? We might as well tax for the carbon tax on the exports. And when you think it through, this will push them into uh, introducing a carbon price generally. Now, if that's right, I think certain regions should just go it alone, see what happens with the World Trade Organization, and break the logjam. Because the problem at the moment, there are many countries who say, well, we wouldn't mind having a carbon price, but only if the whole world does it. Somebody should just damn well do it and put car border carbon adjustments on. Thank you. Uh, Mark, did you want to take the last question? Um, oh, I think it segues very well, because actually I was looking at it, because you, uh, you, you ticked off a number of the points I would have made. Um, first question from, from um, Nick maybe who addressed it to, to, to me specifically, how much of that progress would have been made without an international agreement or would it have been made? And I think I would say my judgment of no ability to back this up with facts, but up until Copenhagen, the kind of the, the, the rush to get ready, uh, the amount of, of uh, effort, focus, popular support was very helpful. And what we saw was something like 1,800 different bits of uh, legislation being passed around the world in the decade up to Copenhagen um, that supported either renewable energy or, or renew uh, energy efficiency or uh, carbon. Um, my sense is that the process since then, however, has been entirely unhelpful because of the loss of credibility of going back and publicly failing to do the same thing again and again. Uh, so that's my sense, and I can't back it up with any academic um, figures. In terms of how does one move the fractal process forwards, I actually think that the responsibility, in a sense, is on those who think that the fractal process shouldn't exist at all. In other words, those who think that you only do anything in response to a global agreement need to explain why did, the Euro why did Europe make such big proactive moves? Why do US states make big proactive moves? Why does the US indeed federally make proactive moves? Why does anybody do anything? Because they do. Why does the C40 cities exist? Why is anybody taking action? And the reason is that the game theory, to pick up on, the, on that theme, that says this is a prisoner's dilemma and nobody will do anything until some central agency comes and sits on everybody's head and we all give them a revolver to point at us and then we'll do something, is wrong. And I publish, I'm not an academic, so it's a white paper rather than a peer-reviewed article, <laughs> but said that, that what this is, is a repeated multi-party prisoner's dilemma of some sort that I'm not qualified to analyze, but I'm going to, I'm going to afterwards we'll have a chat about whether we can. <laughs> but the point is the strategies are likely to be very different. Nice, retaliatory, forgiving, and clear. In other words, if you're going to play this climate game forever, you might as well start by addressing it, you punish people, carbon border adjustments being a very nice tool that we need to look more at. You, cut, you punish people who don't get involved. 
If they then say, we'll come on board, you say, fabulous, have technology, have finance, we'll, we'll celebrate, and then clear, you just tell people what you're going to do. And that is the international process that we need. It's not that we don't need one, but we need an international process that coaches those behaviours, that celebrates people who do take action, that works with the WTO to make sure that what we do is uh, legal and is, is, is consistent, um, and, and that creates uh, the clarity uh, that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And I think that if we focused on nice, retaliatory, forgiving and clear, and put the UNFCC and these unbelievably talented people like Christiana Figueres and so on to work, and, and, you know, and, and yourself, of course, as well, um, <laughs> you know, coaching those behaviours, we would so, move faster. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah, you'll have your well, opportunity no, to... I, no, I, it's not ideal. Idealistic is thinking that we're going to get a cap in advance of countries knowing how they're going to meet those caps. That, I'm afraid, is idealistic. The deal is going to follow countries knowing what they're going to do. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to go to David and Lisa. Are there any comments, views you'd like to just get across uh, from what you've heard? There's, there's one remaining question, I think, still there. Uh, distributed energy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, distributed yeah, energy. Yeah, that, that. Do you want to address that issue? Or? Well, I could um, make a very sort of... Um, short response to that. I mean, I think there are a, a number of ways of, of how we can actually achieve that. I mean, for example, I think in the GAIA report, they talk about extension of the, um, of the electricity grid. Also thinking about microgrids, which might be um, built around sort of more local, regional, um, renewable um, energy initiatives. And then I think also thinking about personal household um, renewable energy instruments as well, such as um, solar power, PV solar power, and so on. Um, and I think it's, it's incredibly important, I think, to actually really try and achieve this distributed energy. Um, when we think about some of the additional wealth creation um, that, that these new mechanisms would actually produce, um, one, of, one of the things that GAIA does try and emphasize is the improvements for food security that having a, a far better distributed energy system would create. Um, and for example, it talks about um, the fact that if you have uh, greater access to electricity, then you'll have less perishability of foodstuffs and also allow local communities to start to process their own foodstuffs as well, which will lead to wealth generation. So I think it's a very interesting question. It would be interesting to hear what some of the other members of the panel believe and whether it, it really is possible. But if it is possible, I think it comes with, again, um, a large number of benefits. Thank you. Uh, David, a comment? Okay. Look, uh, we've got five minutes left in this yeah. session, and I'd like to... Okay. got five minutes left. I want to go back to the, each of the panelists, give them a minute each. Uh, and the particular issue that strikes me as being important, and picking up a little bit of what Chris said, but also the implication, and I've lived with it myself for a long time, and that is that this is a slow-moving global energy system, whether it's the habits of consumers, the capital stocks that are embedded in the system, um, and to some extent the, uh, the meekness of policy makers. Um, if in fact we're faced with the sort of challenges that we have and we need transformation and we want to get on the right track, what should we do in the next year that can make a difference, whoever we are? But what really is the set? I want to give you one minute, and, and it's any aspect, so David, focus on those issues, for example, you're closest to. One minute each, changing the direction of the energy system, and you've got next year as the starting point. Michael. Um, thank you very much. I think that that's a, the key challenge, speeding up the movement of the system. We have to look at system interventions, not looking at individual mechanisms uh, for whether it's feed-in tariffs or this, that, or the other, but look at what slows down the system. One of the things that slows down the system is the influence of incumbents. So things we can do to take incumbents out of lobbying, for instance. Things that we can do to pay off incumbents so that they can make money by retiring assets so they don't have to fight like crazy will speed up um, transitions. A couple of other things that we could do to speed up the system. Information, whether it's eight kilos of systems analysis, or I'm very interested in the idea of open data. 
what open data is providing uh, in terms of a, an impetus to improve governance and, uh, and provision of public services, open data around energy and water can allow and free up innovation, new services, and so on. Uh, and I think that that's very important. And then uh, perhaps something around new platforms, bringing in software companies, telecoms companies, car companies, people who are not around the table right now to the level they need to be to counterbalance some of the sort of inertia that we've got in the current energy system. So I would look for a number of systemic interventions that just speed everything up. And by the way, try and do this through deregulation, not through overregulation. Thank you. Excellent, Mike. David? What's the right track? Um, one of the great tragedies is that most of the innovation in climate change adaptation, in meeting energy development needs, and in moving to mitigation is done by city governments and by strongly organized urban poor groups. And there's lots of innovation going on. And it, no one notices it, but it's, it's, it's transforming disaster risk reduction. Yet all the big goals are always by national governments and international agencies. All the big money is by national governments and international agencies. All bilateral aid is national government to national government. All multilateral agencies are owned by national governments. How can we find the funding at city level, at community level, that drives, supports, multiplies all the innovations on meeting energy needs, on developing resilience to climate change, and ultimately transforming cities so that they also deliver on greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. Thank you, David. Lisa? Okay, well, I, th I think one of the things that really springs to my mind is actually to do um, a much better assessment of what the benefits of um, bringing in these, these new changes into the energy system would actually be. Um, so what are the benefits of reducing climate change? What are the benefits of reducing air pollution? And, and really starting to improve our methodological assessments of making some of those benefits. So, for example, we've talked about food security, we've talked about impacts on ecosystems, we've talked about impacts on human health. And some of the methods that we have currently to try and define exactly what those benefits are could well be improved and could actually provide much stronger and more robust quantifications of how much money we can actually save by making this change. So I think that is something that could really help sort of in, provide information to policymakers about the real cost of the decisions that they're going and, to be and making. And the multiple benefits as well. Yeah. Okay. Chris. I want to go back to the question on distributed energy, but it will lead me to your question. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not a panacea, and I, I notice that the advocates who are saying one day everything should be small and local, then when you tell them that uh, renewables are variable, say let's have an enormous grid all over the whole world, so they're not totally consistent. But one of the big advantages of distributed energy it makes people think about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Even if it's crazy to put solar on your roof, which financially in this country it is totally crazy, it makes people very conscious, and it's, it's making people start then thinking about their other energy and changing their behavior. So I very much agree with what David said, that the bottom-up can drive things. Uh, Top-down what can be done, I think actually the major thing, one of the major challenges now is to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies and increase some of the R&D. We've got to drive down costs. It's all about cost, cost, cost. If it was cheap, we would be implementing the solutions. We've got to drive down the costs. And finally, it is about explaining things, and I very much agree with what, what Lisa said, and it's one of the nice things about this report. When I talk about getting fossil fuels down, the number one reason I give is because of air pollution. If you just say climate change, oh, we've heard that. And that's further away. Uh, pollution, this, this country, by the way, the WHO figures say that outdoor air pollution is killing 14,000 people a year, typically six or seven years loss of life. That's the UK. China, India, much bigger figures. Yeah. Thank you. Naki, brief? Yes, very brief. Um, the, my take on this is that um, we have to talk much more about opportunities and the potential benefits. So to put it in a different language, we need a shared vision. I, I think this has been one of the problems that, you know, we, we tackle many of these issues separately at the level of the government, at the international scene. So this kind of, I think, bottom-up Bottom-up approach, you called it fractal, I like the metaphor. Bottom-up approach, in my view, is the way to go forward. But for that, you need a vision. 
And let me just give you one, one example. Many of the things that we are talking about in transformation are not just capital intensive and bring benefits in the long run, so it's again a long-term vision that we don't have in our decision-making processes, but also many of these uh, decisions are coming ever closer to the consumer. It's not anonymous supplier anymore. I mean, it's the plus energy houses, alternative mobility, so many changes are required in the way we, we do our daily business. So I, I think this is perhaps one of the biggest challenges, not a technological fix. And let me go to the distributed systems and just give the final comment. I, I served or cha chaired an investment board of an oil company, I will not mention which one, uh, for the new energies. And one of the refrains I've overheard whenever you, uh, an idea came up, that's too small. We, we don't do that kind of business. It's way too small for us. And that's also, I think, true for us as individuals. We have to make many small de de uh, decisions. And I think that's the major challenge that we have to work on. Well, let me first of all thank the panel. And, uh